I heard her. She, she opened her mouth to say something else and there was this, this crack. You know, it, it sounded like when mom would feed the meat on the counter with the mallet to tenderize it, but there was a whimper on the back end of that crack. I knew he hit her. I, I fucking knew it. I just, I didn't know with what. I was too scared to get up and check. So next morning, the whole side of her face is just, it's black and blue. And I tried to kiss it better, but she wouldn't let me near it. She just, she said that it was safer there than where we were and that I should just be a good girl. So I did. I was as good a girl as I could possibly be. And I thought that eventually she'd get us out of there. But it was like her spirit just left. She, she still did the chores and, and the housework. But it was like she was just a shell of herself. She, she would sit and stare out the window at, at a world she couldn't, wasn't allowed to be part of. I had eventually grown out of my princess bed and it was replaced with a normal bed. I had nice clothes, but I hated him. I hated him for what he did and what he did to kill my mom the way I knew her and for ruining my life. I swore it would never happen to me. I wouldn't be like that. I, I wasn't as dumb and as desperate as my mom, you know? I had good grades. I was gonna get a scholarship and I was gonna get as far away from that man and that town as I could and I was gonna move her in with me. <sighs> I met him when I was 14. He was 18. And uh, I thought, you know, I had just started high school and I thought I was so cool because an older boy liked me. <sighs> he made me feel special. He, uh, he lived in a row housing complex down the road, like my mom and I used to. And, you know, I didn't feel any living pressure with him, you know, like, like I could just be myself. It's really hard to make friends when you feel like you're living a fucking lie, you know? So, <clears throat> he, he used to tell me how, how smart and how beautiful I was. And, and he used to run his fingers down the side of my face, and he used to brush my hair out of my eyes, like my mom used to do when I was really little. And I mean, that's how you know someone loves you, right? They, they, they don't touch you like that if they don't love you. Well, I guess until that one day, science class and my stupid fucking teacher, Mr. Christian, gave me an assignment with John. John, John was the nerd in the class. <laughs> he was so fucking funny though. He, <laughs> we had this two day experiment dissecting worms. And every time I would make a cut, John would be all like, it was a crazy worm voice. And God, I would just crack up laughing. So, second day, we're leaving class and John is, the why? <laughs> and I was dying. Well, he was meeting me to walk me to my next class. And he took my hand and he brought me from the third floor to the first floor. And he wasn't rough or nothing. I, I didn't think anything was wrong. Shit, I was still laughing when he got me up against that row of lockers. And then he swung. He, uh, he didn't hit me or nothing. Uh, he, he hit the lockers beside me and dented them. Uh, I'll tell you, the sound of his fist hitting that metal just about made me shit my pants. But you know, he didn't he didn't hit me. 
right? So, so it wasn't abuse. Anyway, we, uh, we kept hanging out and we'd drink vodka and smoke weed. It was always me and the boys. Sometimes when they left, he'd accuse me of hitting on them. And, you know, I couldn't understand why. I couldn't understand why he'd get so pissed off. Like, I barely spoke. And I figured it must be that he was, he must really love me, you know? Like, he was so fucking afraid to lose me. <sighs> then he started fucking me in front of him. And I didn't want to, but he made me. And then, then he, <laughs> it happened a few times, uh, and then he got my arms pinned behind my back against a wall and, and told his friend to go ahead and have a turn. Oh my God. And, uh, <laughs> just to go ahead and fuck me, and eventually I'd stop crying. His friend started, but uh, didn't feel good about it, so he left. And then he told me I was a whore, and I liked his friend better than I liked him. Unbelievable. I begged, and I pleaded, and I said, I did not, man, it's like, it's all in your head. And that was the first time he hit me. I was, uh, I was walking away, and, and he picked his boot up off that dirty floor, and he, he, he hit me across the back with it. But, like, I, I, I knew how hurt his feelings were, right? I, I, I couldn't be mad at him. He was, he was hurt. He, he used to brush my hair out of my eyes. He wouldn't. You know what? Fuck that! Right. Fuck that! Oh God. <sighs> the uh, the one guy he used to let fuck me <laughs> turned into ten guys so that he could get more drugs. I didn't stay with weed, it got into so many other things, and, and the more guys he'd let fuck me, the more drugs, and the, the more he'd beat the shit out of me, and tell me that it was my fault, and that I was a whore, and I liked them all better than I liked him. <laughs> and one day, I just couldn't take it anymore. I just, I couldn't fucking take it. So I waited until he passed out, and I, I packed my one bag, and I left. Good I just you. fucking left. Yeah, yeah. Right? I, I can still hear him say my name, though. Honey. <laughs> oh, fuck honey. There's nothing fucking sweet here anymore. No more fucking honey. Oh, that was so brave and courageous of you to share. It must have been so difficult for you to, to come and, and, and go first like that. But you're safe now, right? Sure, I'm safe now. I mean, going first doesn't scare me. I, I stopped caring what people thought about me a long fucking time ago. But I'm here at the shelter now, and he can't get me here. I, uh... They helped me find an auntie over in Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're gonna help me get to her since my mom died a while ago. Oh, so sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> she's finally out of that prison that Prick built for her. And, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, my auntie, she, uh, she has a farmhouse. And she's got gardens and grasses and shit oh, yeah. that she needs help with. So. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I think it'll be, I think it'll be good, you know, to, to kind of start over and reinvent myself. I can still hear his name when I try to sleep at night, though. I can still hear his voice. You're nothing but a whore, honey. And this is a common theme for all of us, right? Like, first we have to validate our surroundings visually. So then, once we realize that we're in a safe space, we can focus on what we hear and what we smell, right? Like feet? Yeah, yeah, like feet. <laughs> And once we know we're physically in a safe place, then we can work on that voice that you mentioned. We know he was just making you feel like a less valuable version of yourself just to use your body. Use my body is right. What a fucking asshole. You're right. What an asshole. So let's disprove that thought. You didn't want to do those things. You know he didn't give you a choice. And you know you're not a whore. So can you say that out loud? Months had passed, and 
I was offered a promotion to financial advisor. I worked my butt off to get those certifications and that license. But on the day I was supposed to start, I couldn't find my keys. I'm a really organized person and I keep an extremely clean house, so I don't understand for the life of me where they could have got to. I was dumping out drawers, I searched through shoes, I called the school to check the kids' backpacks. I even had the neighbors helping me comb the driveway. When I walked back in to call work and tell them I'd be late, he was standing in our bedroom door. I was so flustered when I asked him where he had found them, and he said, You're so fucking stupid, woman. You must have walked past them a hundred times. And I cried. He'd never spoken to me like that before. But I knew he was on edge with me doing so well at my job, so I let it go. We didn't really see a whole lot of each other with me working during the day and him working a lot of overtime, so I guess I didn't really notice his changes in attitude towards me. At least not at the time, anyways. But my things started going missing. Little things. My grandfather's watch, my, my mother's ring, the book I was reading. Really? <laughs> and miraculously, he'd always find them. Of course. What a hero. Use them as an excuse to call me stupid or an idiot. And at the time, I really did feel that way. Looking back, I know it was him hiding them from me to gaslight me. Our relationship was deteriorating. The kids were getting older. But we were in a much better position financially, so we decided to buy a bigger house. It was beautiful. Giant windows overlooking the lake. It was bright and fresh. We bought new furniture and decor, and I really felt like things were looking up. He was still distant and testy. And he certainly wasn't joking anymore when he called me woman. When he said woman, I heard slave. <sighs> Take some time. But I came from a broken home, and I didn't want that for my kids. I wanted to stay true to my marriage vows <coughs> until death do us part, right? One day, I was working remotely from my office at home. And he came storming in. He was pissed. I had forgotten to switch his work clothes over in the laundry. Oh, so he can't do it, right? <laughs> Sorry. I apologized. I told him I was working on some big deadlines. I had never seen him so angry. His face turned red, his eye began to twitch, and his breath I could smell it from the doorway. He was breathing so heavily. And then he picked up a mug that my youngest had made me for Mother's Day. And he threw it at me. It's okay. It's okay. It was heavy. And it made a big dent in the wall. I didn't have time to fix that, so... I just hung a picture over top. But that was the beginning to a cycle. He'd get angry at me over something small and pick things up and throw them at me. There were dents and holes in every room of my house. The final straw was the day that I forgot to buy cream. Cream? Cream. My boys were down the road catching frogs in the creek. They loved that creek. 
I was sitting in the living room in a lounge chair when I heard him from the kitchen. Where's my damn creamer, woman? And I froze. I'm so tired of walking on eggshells and cleaning up messes. I thought maybe that if I didn't respond, he would just leave me alone. But he picked up the antique rocking chair that I used to rock my kids to sleep when they were infants, and he threw it at the wall. It broke into a hundred pieces, and one of those pieces busted through the picture window. <laughs> and he walked away like nothing had happened. <laughs> I knew that I had to get home. So I caught my breath, cleaned up the mess, I burnt that chair in the pit outside so the boys wouldn't find it, and taped cardboard over the picture window. I told them that a bird had broken the window. Some bird. Mm. Big bird. Let's be supportive, guys. Okay. I packed his bags and waited till the next time that he was on 3 to 11s to leave. I was already in the car when the kids got home, and I told them, get in, we're going on vacation. We went a couple cities over, meet up with a girlfriend and her kids. While I was there, I called the police station to file a report. They said that they couldn't take my statement over the phone. It had to be in person. I tried to explain to them the circumstances that I was terrified of his outburst and that I needed to get away from him. But they told me that because I did not have a separation or custody agreement, I could be charged with child abduction. Oh my god. <sighs> so stupid. So, I waited until Monday. I called work to explain the circumstances. They gave me two weeks leave, no questions asked. That's helpful. Yeah. yeah. I waited till the kids left for school and then I went to the police station in person. I tried to file a restraining order, but because he had never actually hit me, they couldn't do that. No kidding. Mm. Oh, the court <clears throat> ordered 50-50 custody because he has a right to see his children. I was ordered to pay him child support. And because I'm the one who left the house, he got to keep it. <laughs> there are holes in the law as big as the holes in my house, and nobody has any answers. I now live in a not so great area of town because I can't afford anything else. The kids still have to go see him, and they cry every single time they leave. They say he's distant and angry, spends all of his time in the garage, but it's his right. Their grades are slipping. I've talked to their teachers. I've searched out resources, but nobody has any answers because nobody cares. Last week, this man walked into my office. He sat down in front of me, and when I told him that his assets were decreasing in value, he let out this breath. It smelled just like his the day that he had thrown that mug at me, and the room spun. Words sounded like they were underwater. I thought I was going to pass out. It felt like I was looking at the man in front of me through a screen. I could not tell you what was said for the rest of the meeting. And as soon as he left, I went to my boss and I asked her for another leave. But they were much less understanding. I was never a victim in those four walls. That was the only place that I was able to maintain my professionalism. 
but I don't feel like I should be helping people make important decisions about their life when I can't even make important decisions about mine. That's why I'm here. I can't keep living in fear. And normally I don't. But sometimes, something triggers me. And it sticks with me for days. Sometimes weeks on end. Yeah, coming to us was a brave and courageous decision. You have to honor your own emotions. It's good and it's part of your healing and of your separation. But did you hear what you said at the end? That I get triggered? Yeah. No, no, not that part. <laughs> no. uh, that you can't make meaningful decisions about your life. Coming here is a meaningful decision. And leaving was a meaningful decision for you and your children. Okay? Sometimes we have to look at our thought patterns and, and how they reflect that stall you from your progress and keep you into that past space. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe we'll start... You think it'd be helpful to write down a few things, like positive things that you've done to change your situation overall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be willing to try anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Cupcake. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, it was actually a nickname that was given to me by my coworkers. I'm the only girl on the crew and I outwork most of the guys. Most of them have a ton of respect for me, but there's always one or two new guys who try to stop me from doing a job because it's too hard or too heavy. But my boss is awesome. He actually builds me special wrenches that give me extra torque, so even if something is hard, I don't have to ask for help. Cupcake was started by one of the newer jerk-offs. He was trying to loosen a nut that was really tight and got frustrated. He threw his wrench across the site. I walked over, put mine on, gave it a little kick, came off easy as pie. Yeah, you did. <laughs> the guy started teasing him and said, Cupcake could do a better job than he could. It was actually an empowerment until I got home and told him about it. He hates hearing about the guys building me up, and he gets endlessly jealous of my friendships. And, of course, he was drunk and started screaming at me. It's okay. Take a breath and, and keep grounded, okay? He used to hit me, but I realized a long time ago that if I just went to bed, that he would leave me alone. Paul, at least if I pretended I was sleeping, he wouldn't hit me. Mm. The night that he heard the Kaiser were calling me Cupcake, he was extra ragey, like I had never seen before. He started throwing glasses and smashing plates in the kitchen. There was nothing I could do, so I left. I couldn't go far because our car was broken down, and it was a Friday, the guys had just dropped me off from work, and no one would be back to get me until Monday. So I just went out on the stairs to have a smoke. I was just sitting there on the stairs, and he kicked open the door so hard that I went flying off of the stairs. No. Then, he picked up my still-lit cigarette and burnt me on the arm while he said, How do you like that, cupcake? I screamed for him to stop, but we live so far away that no one I reached for a rock that was nearby, I was going to smash him with it to get him to leave me alone, but I couldn't get to it. The next thing I know, he was on my back, and he had his hands around my neck. I was pretty sure I was going to die. He choked me until I passed out. I think he thought he killed me. The next thing I remember was waking up, gasping for air. I was crying uncontrollably, and I could feel little rocks embedded into my palms and my knees and my pants. They were sticking to my legs, so 
I knew that I was leaving. He just stood there, silent for a second. And then he brought me in the house and said, here, let me help you get cleaned up. I was so unsure of what happened that I let him. I was crying so hard, but it felt like there was no noise coming out of my mouth. It's like the air I was breathing was going into my lungs, but it wasn't reaching my brain. I began to heave the food that I had put in my mouth on the way home from work until I puked. I remember seeing my puke mixed in with broken pieces of glass on the floor. I felt like I was like curled up in the house where the ceiling meets the wall. Like I was this teeny tiny version of myself watching this scene unfold. Like I was watching myself in a horror movie, the worst and most confusing movie I had ever seen. He went to the bathroom to grab some toilet paper to try and clean the tears and snot that was pouring down my face. But that's useful. He didn't use enough pressure to do anything useful. Then he clumsily used his hand to try to wait the hair out of my face that was partially still braided from work. But it was stuck to dirt and rocks and blood from when I fell. Walk. I need a smoke. Oh, oh, no smoking in here. Yeah, no, sorry. It's okay, take a break. Yeah, it's a lot. I remember feeling like I was gonna throw up again from the smell of B.O. and alcohol that was coming off of him. So, I calmed myself down and I brought myself to the bathroom to get myself cleaned up. I could hear him sobbing on the couch as if it was him that had been hurt. I know that I'm strong enough that I could have walked out there and knocked his fucking ass out. Hell yeah. But I couldn't. I was completely stuck in freeze mode. So fucking stupid. So, I spent the weekend with him. I laid there, staring at the ceiling while he had sex with me. I even made dinner on Saturday and Sunday. Monday morning, the guys picked me up for work like they always do, and I could tell that they were worried about me, but they have too much respect for me to ask. I just told them that I hit my chin while I was out on my ATT. But Josh, he knew. He said, you know, Cupcake, I'm here for you. Anything you need, I got you. And I know that he would have kicked his ass, but I just said I was fine and walked away. <sighs> then, there was this small accident at work. I wasn't properly tied off to a rig and I fell. I didn't fall far, like maybe six feet, and I landed on a sand hill, so I was perfectly fine. But company policy said I had to go to the hospital. I begged them not to take me, but our company had just received some fines for unsafe practices and I had to go. I was terrified because I knew I was hiding so many injuries. When I got to the hospital, I was visibly shaken. The nurse said, you don't have anything to be afraid of. It's just a routine checkup. She gave me a gown and left the room. I thought about running. I seriously did because running was way less embarrassing than saying I was some big ass weakling who had got the crap beat out of her by her boyfriend. You're not weak. So I put on a gown and sat on the bed. Tears began to fall from my eyes, just silently, one at a time. The nurse, she came back in my room and I could tell that she was worried when she seen the scrapes and bruises on my body. But when that, her eyes wandered to that cigarette burn on my arm, she knew. She said, these injuries aren't from your workplace, are they? I shook my head no. She asked if this was my partner. I nodded. She asked if I wanted the police, and I shook my head no again. Then she asked if I wanted to be admitted to the hospital. And that is when the tears came all at once. 
there was no more one by one. It was like a river in the spring that washes all the bridges we have to repair. There was nothing that could be done but wait for them to stop. That nurse, I wish I knew her name. She was phenomenal. She didn't wince. She didn't move. Her breathing pattern didn't change. She just stood there silently holding my hand while tears wore bruise in the dirt of my working girl face. The doctor knocked and opened the door. The nurse just looked in his direction and shook her head. The doctor nodded and let the door close. About 10 minutes later, there was a crisis team in my room and everything happened so quickly after that. I remember feeling so dumb and ashamed, but they just reassured me that none of this was my fault and that there was ways to get away and keep myself safe. It was actually the perfect time because he thought I was away at work. They admitted me to the hospital and took x-rays. They found four fractures and they took photos of my bruises. I remember being so afraid to talk to the police, but they told me it was the best thing I could do and to keep myself safe. I wasn't sure how I was going to live without him, but I knew it was the right thing to do. They arrested him and pressed charges. Good. He spent the night in jail and I was still in the hospital, so they put a restraining order against him it prevented him from contacting me or coming near me. I stayed with my mom for about a month, and then I heard from a mutual friend that he was a mess, that his power had been cut off, and that he hadn't eaten. So I called him. Oh, no. oh. He told me he was going to kill himself. Oh, God. So I went back. It's not his fault he's the way that he is. He doesn't want to be that way. I mean, he cried when I was in the bathroom, right? I've been back for about three weeks and everything's been okay. But every time I see him reach for a glass, I wince. And I can't even sit at the table where he was trying to clean my tears and my snot. It's like I leave my body and I fly up to that corner of the room again. I just don't know what to do. Like, I know I shouldn't be in this space and that I could be charged for being here. And that would cause me to lose my job, but I don't know what to do. I'm more afraid to leave now than I was before. And every night when we go to bed, he sleeps with a knife under the mattress. And every time he hears a noise, he grabs it and just stares out the window. And when I leave for work on Mondays, he tells me if I don't come back on Friday, that he's going to hurt my mother. Jesus. She's disabled and can't defend herself. He's psychotic? I just don't know what to do. I don't think he would actually hurt my mother, but what if, you know, what if? Josh dropped me off today, and he's going to come back and get me too. He keeps telling me that I need to take care of myself, that we have benefits and coverage and an EAP. Is Josh single? No. <laughs> like, I just, he has access to my emails and all of to my stuff. I don't even think I could set anything up. Yeah. You're great for coming in today, and Josh seems like a nice and supportive guy. Yeah, he gets it. He has a wife and a couple kids. He'd never want to see anything like this happen to them. No. And, and I'm happy to see you working with somebody like that, okay? Um, somebody who's supporting you. It helps us to see the forest through the trees, right? Yeah. Okay. And listen, anytime you're ready, we have resources. We can help you to get away once you are ready. Okay. <clears throat> <coughs> I should 
never have gone back in the first place. I was so fucking stupid. No, no, you were not stupid. It's normal not to know how to think or feel without being in the confines of an abusive relationship. You know, most women have to leave seven times before they leave for good, so going back is normal. What makes it so hard, though, is by that seventh time, most of our family and friends are done with us. They just can't keep watching it happen. And, you know, I get it. It's hard watching someone you love so much be hurt time and time again by someone who's not even worthy of having a pet hamster, let alone a life partner. Seriously. You're right, and it's important to remember that these people who abuse us, it's because of their own internal it has nothing to do with you, and you can't change them, nor should we try, okay? The most important thing is to keep ourselves, and especially our children, safe. And Cupcake, we can get you some information, we can get you over to our intake coordinator, and it's perfect because you work out of town from Monday to Friday, so we can help you so you have a place to stay on the weekends, okay? It's just easier, then you'll have somewhere and you won't feel so alone, okay? And then you get your own place. It's, you're already in a really good position because you have a good job and you have Josh who's very supportive. And you mentioned your mom. She's disabled. But do you think she'd be part of your support system as well? Oh, yeah. She's totally good. Perfect. Okay, and, and you still have clothing to wear as well, right? Clothing. I have one fucking bag of clothes because he has cut up and destroyed the rest of my shit in his ragey times, including shirts from my grandmother and family heirlooms. He has destroyed anything that made me me. I've had my clothes cut up too. Me too. Me too. Oh. It was um, <clears throat> just after I won the second municipal election. I was heading to Ottawa for an International Women's Day conference. I was to speak to 2,500 women about fair and equitable treatment of women in the workplace. I had just finished going over my speech and sent emails to the manager of the company that I own that I would, wouldn't be readily available for the next couple of days. Um, I was packing my carry-on for my flight the next morning. I was only supposed to be gone for two days. The first day for the orientation and the presenter's luncheon and the second day for the presentations themselves. My flight was scheduled to leave at 5.30 a.m. He was enraged because I had forgotten to make a follow-up appointment with his doctor. No wonder I don't like men. <laughs> he has some kind of skin rash on his hands from mowing the lawn or some such nonsense. Can't deal with that result? Mm. Anyway, I simply told him call the doctor yourself. And he went ballistic. He started yelling at me that I was the worst wife in the world, that I couldn't even cook or clean for my husband, and didn't care enough about him to worry about his health, and cared more about saving the world than I did about saving our marriage. Now, these tangents have been going on for a long time, and normally I can ignore them until they pass, but this one particular day, he was incredibly nasty. He kept yelling at me, saying I was worthless, and soon I would be nothing because everyone was going to know the kind of phony I was. It's hard, you know. As a female in politics, I have to watch my every move, my every word. Everything I say and do has to be dealt with such care. I think it's exhausting. I love being the one to advocate for our citizens and knowing what moves need to be made in order to keep order and dealing with the bureaucracy that holds our system back while still moving it forward. It's an incredible honor to be trusted by the majority of our citizens. But when I'm at home though, that is supposed to be my safe place. Yes. That should be the place that I can sit back, de-stress, put my feet up, you know? But it seems like every time he feels that I'm becoming too successful, he's got to take me down a notch. Okay. He has to make sure that he's the first thing on my mind at all times. 
So, while he was walking around the house, looking at me with disgust and muttering a slew of insults against me and my character, I just grabbed my bag and silently slipped out the door. I was sitting in my car thinking, maybe he was right. I am worthless. I mean, what kind of woman goes out and advocates for women's rights when I can't even manage my own rights at home? In this space that I pay for. He opened the side door to the house, which was shielded from the neighbors by a row of hedges, and said, look dear, you forgot your laptop, and then smashed it with a hammer. He just held it up in the air, smashed it with a hammer, knocking it to the ground. Smashed to a million pieces. I was sitting in my car, sobbing and sweating. It was so hot. And I forgot my clothes in the house. I couldn't open the window. I couldn't leave. But sitting in that extreme heat was better than going back in that house. I was hunched over my steering wheel, with my head in my hands, and there was a tap on the window. If the sunroof had been open, I'd probably jump clear through it. It was him. He was holding up my car keys. He opened the door gently and said, have a nice trip, love, and walked away. It always confuses me how he can Jekyll and hide it so quickly. One minute he's losing it and calling me every name in the book, and the next he's wishing me a great day. If I was to ask him about the things that happened, for instance, if I said, why did you smash my laptop? He'd say, what are you talking about? You dropped it on your way out the door. You really need to lower your stress level. Think you're starting to go crazy. <laughs> It's you. It's you. Yeah. I learned to stop asking. It just adds to the confusion. Anyway. I didn't want to go back in the house, so I went and got some fast food and tried to find a new laptop. Found a cheap one. Went by my office to reload what I would need on it for the next couple of days. And our security settings are ironclad, so I had to call a person from our IT department to give me a hand. I told him I dropped my laptop down the stairs. He laughed and helped me reload it. My speech was saved on the Google Drive, so once I was able to log in, it was easy to find, and I knew I'd get through the next couple of days seamlessly. I boarded my flight for 5.30 a.m., the 6 a.m. departure, and by the time I transferred planes and landed in Ottawa at 1 p.m., there were 16 text messages from him. He was accusing me of having an affair with the man from my IT department. I didn't know. Huh, right? Just kept yelling at me, calling me a slut, saying that we were over. <clears throat> um, a few years ago, when things were still good, we used to send sexy photos back and forth to each other whenever we were away. Yeah, girl. You know, talk about dirty things. Been there. I think most couples do things like that, right? Well, you know, he says he's going to release them to the public every time he gets in one of these moods. The problem is, I don't think that he won't. He would absolutely destroy my image. I, I tried to call him to work things out and let him know that I only needed access to my files for the presentation, but he wouldn't answer the phone. Oh, no, he doesn't to talk. just kept texting me, saying, I'm saying that soon everyone was going to find out the real kind of slut that I was. Oh. I had resolved myself to the fact that this was going to be a trip from hell. But there wasn't a damn thing I could do about it now, so I just silenced my phone and went to the orientation. They walked us through where we would sit and what the presentations would look like. 
Uh, and currently, I keep my notes on my phone, but every time I took it out of my purse, there were more alerts and threats to my character from him. So I quickly put it back in my purse and took out the handy dandy notebook I have for such occasions. Do you have to carry a notebook with you so often? So I was taking my notes in handwriting while joking with the other CEOs I was with that I was old fashioned and sometimes just needed to write things down with pen and paper. I really am good at hiding my stress when I need to. Well, most of the time. I went back to my room after a couple of hours of talking with the organizers stage managers and sponsors of the event and collapsed into my bed. My eyes were puffy from not having a proper sleep and my head was pounding with pressure. I called room service for a bottle of wine and some preparation H to help with the puffiness. What? I'm a Cosmo girl too. <laughs> I only had a couple of glasses of wine before I went downstairs, but the lack of food and sleep had me feeling inebriated. I didn't know how much the wine had affected me until I saw our premier, though. When he congratulated me on funding that I had received to help resolve a situation that we had initially had opposing views on, I took it personally. Like he was trying to provoke me. I told him that he was an idiot for second guessing me and thinking I wouldn't be successful. <laughs> I told him that he'd be seeing more of me soon, and he shouldn't be surprised when his constituents find out what an insidious prick he is. Sorry. Well, I thought I was being quiet and inconspicuous, but another counselor from the next town over came and gently pulled me away from the situation. I was apprehensive to leave the conversation because I had more I wanted to say to him. <laughs> when she said to me, my friend, what is going on? I, I fell apart. I started crying and left the banquet hall. I was thankful when she followed me out to see what I needed told her I was tired and just needed a cup of coffee. She asked me if I had eaten and through the sobs that were racking my body and the tears streaming down my face, she recognized my whimper as a no. And brought me up to my room. She stayed with me while I sobbed. And even though it was a turning point in her career, and she should have been downstairs with our colleagues, she ordered me pasta and water and paid for it when room service brought it upstairs. That's a good friend. I don't know when she left, because I guess I passed out. But when I woke up the next morning at 6 a.m. to my alarm, there was a glass of water and two Advil beside my bed. I dreaded going back downstairs. I couldn't get the look of the Premier's face off my mind. He is such a prick. It's, it's so fucking hard, you know. As a woman, I have had to fight for every ounce of respect that I've got. And, and then something like this happens. And it affects my credibility exponentially. No one understands. Like, no one sees the abuse I take. Not just from home, from my constituents, too. <clears throat> I have one outburst to someone that I feel threatened by. Of course, I do it in public. And I have to claw my way back into people's respect, or at least into their tolerance. It becomes such a conundrum. Who am I really? A super strong politician who can argue points for hours and facilitate societal change? Or the slut who slept my way to the top?
<coughs> anyway. To go back to my original point. Okay. When I got home from one of the worst experiences of my life, he was sitting on the couch watching baseball. He just looked up at me and said, Hey, slut, how was your trip? As if nothing had happened. I was exhausted. I went to my room and saw little piles of my clothes everywhere. It started out where they were little squares roughly cut and scattered about the room. And then it was like he was in a rush to finish the job, like just a slit through each piece the closer to the closet I got. I turned around and saw my dresser and all of its contents empty too. Nothing could be repaired and nothing could be donated. The noises that came out of me as I cried were guttural. I know what you mean when you said it felt like you were floating to the corner of the room and watching yourself. This happened to me too. I just, I just don't understand how anyone can be so hateful. So you left, right? Left? Yes. God, no. How do I leave? Sacrifice my home? My, my business? My entire life? No. I come here. I bitch about it, and then I leave. It's the best I can do. You're right. It's the best that you can do today for yourself. Listen, we all know we've had varying levels of strength at different times and what safety means for us at different times too, right? But everything you've gone through, I'm really proud of you for coming here and, and showing yourself to us. It takes incredible strength and courage to do that, okay? But just like what makes us feel safe can differ from person to person, sometimes we need more one day than we do the next and that's just how it is. We have to allow everyone the space to, to listen to themselves and, and just make sure that we feel safe, okay? Yeah. I know what you mean about trying to destroy pieces of us. I'm an ER nurse that helps to take care of women who are in distress, but I'm also a potter. Or at least I used to be. I love to make colorful art, and I had the opportunity to show it in an art gallery downtown in my hometown. It was during one of those large artisan fairs, so I had my artwork viewed by thousands, and I was so excited about it. I worked for six months on my pieces, but it was tough, though. You know, my mom had fallen ill and was in a home, so. I had to care for her house and our house, and I was in school for my final year of nursing. Oh, wow. Yeah. For you. Graduation was my deadline, you know, to get away from him. He had hurt me so many times, and my self-worth was in the dumps, even though I was at the top of my class. You'll never amount to anything without me, sweetie. bug me and bug me to use the college fund money that my parents had saved up for me to buy a house for us. So, after all that, eventually I did. I had to wait until we built up enough equity in our house so I could go back to school. He wanted to have children too, but I couldn't bear the thought of raising a child in an environment like I was in. I had two abortions that he didn't know about. I mean, thank God he didn't find out about them either because I'd be dead. Sure. 
He was an explosive man. And he'd smash things around me. Or leave the house and say he was leaving me. And when I shut the door behind him, he'd kick it in. He broke my finger one time and said it was my fault because I was in the way. I used to take birth control pills and I'd take them when he went to work. I used to hide them underneath the side of my bedside table. Well, he found them one time and he beat the living shit out of me. I'm so sorry. He kicked me in my face with his steel toe boot and he broke the orbital socket. Oh. The neighbors heard the screaming when they called the police. So they came and they arrested him and brought him to jail and the ambulance took me to the hospital. They ended up having to put me in a coma for three days so they could fix my face. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for the plastic surgeon that was on call that day. I don't even have a scar, see? Wow. Do you have a number for that guy, or? <laughs> Keep on track, guys. <laughs> Keep going. So, when I woke up in the hospital three days later, I couldn't remember the attack at first, but I knew why I was there. I knew I was lucky to be alive. There was an officer there named Jacob Thomas, and he came to take my statement. And right away, I could feel the intensity of his empathy. He was gentle and caring. And he encouraged me to press charges, but even in the state I was in, I was convinced it was my fault for hiding the pill, so I told him no. You know, I'll never forget it either. It was what he said to me next that made me make the plan to get away. He said, the only person who should have control over your life is you. When you're ready to get away, I will help you. He gave me a cell phone number and, you know, I still remember it to this day. So, when I got back from the hospital, he was already there. Right away, he went into this talk about how he wouldn't have done this to me if I hadn't lied to him. Bullshit. I told him I was exhausted and I just needed to lie down and get some sleep. I don't know exactly how long I was asleep for, but. I woke up to the sound of something great. I was groggy and I couldn't identify the sound at first, but then it hit me. It was the sound of pottery smash. Oh. I knew he was in one of his moods. So I just put the pillow back over my head and cried myself back to sleep. My show was only a month away. And I remember thinking, that's it. I'm just going to have to cancel. Now, when I finally got out of bed about four days later, I mustered up the courage to go into my art studio and the damage that he had done to my artwork. It hurt me more than the damage that he'd done to my face. I remember the whole room spinning and feeling like I was going to pass out. I remember putting my head on the door jam and I started picking up the pieces of the first pop. I don't know why, but I started to remember the Japanese ritual of putting things back together with gold. And in that moment I thought, maybe I can do the same. Maybe I'll put my pieces back together with glue and I'll fill the cracks with silver. You know, I'll make my booth abstract instead of fine art. 
And that way I would still be able to participate. With every piece I put back together, it felt like I was putting together my self-worth and my dignity. And by the time I was finished, I devised a plan to get away. You know, I finish off my final placement and I graduate and then I leave. But you know, finding a placement was hard though. He was well known in town and he painted me all kinds of awful to all kinds of people. Said that he had hurt me when I attacked him with a piece of all that. Oh, what? <laughs> I know, <laughs> slugger. <sighs> I had to do my placement 40 minutes away because no one local wanted me in their facility. Hell, even the home my mama was in, when I went in with her, they were cold to me. Sure, they were professional, but they were cold. And my poor mom. She passed away about a week before my graduation. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. And the weirdest part is, is I'd never felt so grateful. It was almost like she was giving me permission to move away and never come back. He, of course, was excited, going on and on about an inheritance of some sort. You know, always about the money. On the day of my graduation, I walked across that stage and through the auditorium and out the back door. Good, good girl. I called Officer Thomas too and he came to pick me up. He took me to the shelter and from there the shelter got me in touch with the real estate agent, you know, to sell my mama's house. It was in good shape too and I really just needed the capital. So I closed within a week and I skipped town. You know. I've been here for about five years now, and every time I see a woman come into the emergency room with the bruises, I know, I can just tell. You know, I've repeated Officer Thomas's words over and over again in hopes that it has the same impact that it had for me. It's just so hard when you feel so helpless, though. Was he ever charged? You know what? Yeah. He was. He was retroactively charged for breaking my orbital socket and, you know, some other run-ins with the cops. Good. But I waited so long for a trial date, though, that all the charges were dropped. Of course. What? Some kind of formality. <sighs> anyway, that's not even the worst part. I left without a trace. Or so I thought. But about three weeks ago, I was at work, and I get a call that there's some delivery for me. So I go down to check it out. Huge bouquet of these red roses. When I read the card, it said, I still love you, sweetie. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> right away, it took me right back, and that's why I'm here today. I'm still working, but I'm here until they do some investigating to find out where he is and what he's doing. I mean, I at least know that this place is safe and I can get some sleep, but I just don't know how he found me. All I know, though, is that being here feels right, and Sacco here has been helping me get into pottery again, and that has felt nice, so thank you. You do a great job. I've learned so much from you. I wish I could get my soul back. Oh, what did you say, Cookie? I wish I could get my soul back. I was a professional pilot back in India. It's a classical dance. Let me show you. Oh. I'm 
until he broke all the bones in my ankle. I had emergency surgery, which helped me to walk again, but the plates and screws that are in my leg mean that I've been unable to dance for the past seven years. Why didn't you tell any of us here at work? I was so scared. Like, I need this job to get my permanent residency here in Canada, and I, I, I was scared that I would lose it. I, I can't. Yeah. Do, do you want to tell us more of your story? The hardest part was getting away. Always oh, is. <clears throat> he. We lived in Abu Dhabi, and he works in fuel and oil distribution. Uh, my mom, brother, and I had just received our paperwork to go to Canada. He was also responsible for off-site communication and remote control for one of the largest oil companies in the world. He was good with technology and privacy because of that. And when we got our applications to go, he just didn't want to let me go. And that should have been my first clue. But I thought it was romantic. So we eloped the night that we were supposed to go and move to my new home country. We had a couple of children, a couple of years apart, and I didn't work because I didn't have to. He made enough money financially that we lived comfortable. His job put him under a lot of pressure though, and he would yell and scream at me in front of the kids. No, not in front of the kids. I remember he took this brass lantern down from the hook from the living room and just started swinging it at me. I. I was scared, the kids were scared, and there was so much noise around, so I just took my kids into the bathroom, and I started singing to them. I just, I, till it stopped. And he stopped, and then, and my kids fell asleep, and I, we, Apart from the outings to the library and living at home, I was so isolated. He never let me... I wanted to visit my mom and brother, right? And every time I brought it up, he would make sure something came up. So I decided to search for my own passport and book my own ticket. But when I asked him for it, he said he had lost it. Mm. Yeah, mm. So I decided to search for my kids' passports, and they weren't where he, it was either. And every time I asked him about it, he would accuse me for not trusting him and then yell at me yet again. Like I said, apart from the eyes to the libraries and staying at home, I felt so isolated. And he would even limit my communication with my mom and brother. So after three years, I was speaking to them maybe two or three times a year. On one of the library outings, I met up with a group of moms and started telling them everything that was happening to me. Like how he would come home late at night smelling like alcohol and would force me to have sex with him even though I wanted to sleep. How he would make fun of my body and how it jiggled when I danced. Seriously. Anything, anything he could make me, anything he could say to make me feel bad about myself. I won't even get into the story of how he broke my leg. It's a safe space here. You can share with us, okay? Anyway, on one of these outings, a mom 
stepped up and told me she would help me to flee the country and she, ha she would connect me with her laptop and within two weeks they filled out my emergent refugee papers and gave me yellow papers to leave the country. And one night at 12.30, with a suitcase, a backpack full of snacks and a suitcase full of clothes, we left. A taxi took us to a shelter and the room was very cold and dirty, but we had to live there for a day. Our flight was at 11.30 p.m. the next day and a chaperone took us straight to security and when we showed the yellow papers, they let us through. No searches, nothing. That's amazing. That's perfect. When we landed in America, the flight attendant took us off first and took us straight to the next gate. I was so scared he had found us. But, they took me into a room and started interrogating me on why I was leaving and what my relationship with my children. I, I don't understand how the whole system is built up against our right to safety. I was so scared. After what seemed like an eternity, he led us through, but we had already missed our flight, so we had to sleep in the airport. And we took the next possible flight, and we were on it for an hour and a half. And once we landed, a chaperone picked us up again and took us to a train station where we boarded a train. At this point, I was traveling for so long, I didn't even know what time or day it was. Did you remember your name? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully. Um, when we reached the train station, a taxi took us to the border and some border officers took my children in to another room and an officer sat down with me and asked me the same questions. And it seemed like forever that they asked me at the last airport. I couldn't stop shaking and crying every time he brought back those questions. And after what seemed like an eternity, he stood up, put his hands on my shoulder and said, you're safe now, welcome home. Oh. And I have never cried more tears in my life. <sighs> I went and straight, I hugged my kids and I noticed that the um, Lady, the border officers had given them ketchup, chips, smarties, and chocolate milk. We live in Canada with my mom now, and he's banned from entering Canada. Um, yeah, so that's why I'm here. I don't want them to send me back. And, and you are still safe here. You're brave and you're important to our team. You're welcome to join in on group anytime. And you need to know that if you need anything else, just let us know and we can help, okay? Thank you. I'm so glad I'm here and I found you all. Awesome. Awesome. You deserve a place to feel safe. So do I. So does everybody. When I was a kid, we were expected to just play with the hand we were dealt and not complain. When a boy picked on you, or was mean to you, we were told it was because he liked you. <coughs> like it was some kind of reward to be picked on by a boy. <sighs> Fucking bizarre. Sometimes it can make you feel special or wanted, but in a backwards sort of way. Like, why would you look for somebody to be shitty to you in order to be seen or validated? I'm bitch. Why? Because that's what the first boy who tried to have sex with me called me when I told him no. I didn't always know I was interested in women. I just knew I didn't like boys. This one, he had his hands all over me. And I hated it. So when he tried to kiss me, he put his tongue in my mouth. 
I managed to shove him away. <laughs> he called me a bitch and told the other kids that he had sex with me. He made fun of me for weeks. Kids are so mean. I was 12. Oh, oh my God. God. I couldn't talk to my parents about it because, as I mentioned before, their attitude towards boys was if he liked you, he would be mean to you. I didn't understand why I was supposed to be a pushover when it came to that kind of stuff. I was never a pushover. I got good grades, I was athletic, and I was a funny kid. Everyone liked talking to me. Until we hit that age where girls like boys, and boys like girls, and I... I didn't know what I liked. I didn't know who I was. So this boy, he haunted me for years. I would walk my dog, and I'd sense him lurking around the corner watching me. One day, I whacked on the back of my head and fell hard. I was dragged into the trees. He had me this time. I completely froze. He was finally able to do exactly what he wanted. I'm so pissed at myself for not fighting back. One punch and you wouldn't know what hit him. I just laid there, still. When he was done, he got, he got up and looked at me laying on the ground. I said, how do you like that bitch? There's not really such a thing as therapy back then. So through high school and university, I self-sued with marijuana. It quieted my brain when I felt like I was losing control. I met her when I was doing hair on my first film. <laughs> she worked hard on set. She was really funny. She was different like me. But I mean, she wasn't sure she really liked boys either. We got along so well. And I finally felt like I had met somebody who accepted me for me. Like I was going to honor, be honored by somebody who understood. The first time we kissed, it was magic. Like fireworks went off. <laughs> a whole factory's worth. While a string quartet played unchained melody in the background. Oh. <laughs> I knew I was in love at that very moment. Like I'd do anything for her. It's a good freaking thing, too, because as soon as we broke apart, I felt her fist on my cheek. Why? Her fist on my cheek. I was so confused. I was falling in love, and she was kicking my ass. I felt like she must have been confused about her feelings, and that to love someone meant to forgive them for their mistakes. So I did. We just moved forward, and it wasn't brought up again. It was another six months before we were intimate again. <laughs> Cue the music. It was electric. Like earth shattering, mind blowing. Ladies, if you are still sleeping with a man, you are missing out. <laughs> <laughs> the beating afterwards that I received was also intense. Bruises covered my whole body, and I began to cope less and less with humor as time went on spent extra time focusing on my work, and I struggled in social situations. No one got it. She was loving and caring until we were intimate, and then she became unrecognizable and violent. Finally, one day, she just up and left. Turns out she wasn't gay at all. Probably why she was so pissed off after sex all the time. <laughs> Who knows? I still felt like it was my fault. It's not his fault. I met another woman when I was about 40. You I... were 40? Wait, how old are you? <laughs> Botox, baby. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> she had blonde hair, blue eyes, and the prettiest smile. She was successful and really feminine. I felt like I'd won the lottery. We lived together about five years when we had an argument one day over who was supposed to pick up our puppy from the vet. Would you believe that I actually raised my hand to her? I slapped her right in the mouth. Oh my God. She was shocked. I was more shocked. 
It was like that point in the movie when the music gets super loud and the cymbals crash and just like that, the most tense silence rings in your ears. We both stared at each other in shock for a second and she ran straight to our room to lock the door. I came here, to this building. You guys have always had the most wonderful staff here. Here I was, the abuser, knocking on the door asking for help. A lot of men don't have that luxury. You know what? They were so awesome to me. We discussed that somewhere in my subconscious, I felt that if I hurt her first, she couldn't hurt me. I never told anyone all of the things that had happened to me throughout my life. I must have filled that poor woman's ears for two and a half hours. But when I was done, when I was finally done, I felt like there had been a weight lifted from my shoulders. I went home and explained to the love of my life that I had a lot of terrible things happen to me, but I was committed to getting therapy to make sure that I handled them properly. She forgave me, and here we are 15 years later. 15 years. 15 years. Yes. <laughs> Our dog just died, and I'm so sorry. Thank you. We're going to take some time to travel. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. Even though things are so good, you still come to group. <laughs> well, things go well because I come to group. I stopped for about six months, and I felt like the world was like caving in on me. Like I was walking on glass and really jumpy. I just, I just felt like I needed to come back here. And when I started, it really grounded me and got me back into the space where um, I could sort of manage life a little better. I come here because it makes me feel less alone. And because <laughs> it's really what's best for me, I think she'd kill me if I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, that concludes our session for today. But please feel free to come back in two weeks about when we do our talk about why we. So why you get so angry with certain people, why some situations make you want to turn away from the world, and why you find it hard to overcome these emotions. Okay? Yeah. We'll see you in two weeks. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, take care, okay? Yeah. Thank you.